Mr. McQueen. Sir. In my life, Sidney Poitier has taken all my best parts. <laughs> you are my last hope. <laughs> Mr. McQueen was born in 1969. And what is so joyous about that fact is that he was born on foreign soil. He was born in England of African and Caribbean descendants. And in his life as a European, he gained great insights into the life of black people in America. And what was so stunning about your film was that in the depiction of this great American tragedy, great world tragedy, but revealed in ways in America that was very different from all other places that make up the African diaspora, why did you choose to use only artists that were from other countries and from other cultures in depicting black life in America? Well, <clears throat> I'm sounding like Harry right now, so I lost my voice. He's trying desperately to sound like me, so. <laughs> I'm making all these phone calls sounding very good. <laughs> um, well, um, I'll do my best. For me, it wasn't about that. That wasn't the original plan. The original plan was about getting the best people for the job. Um, for me, Michael Fassbinder playing Epps was the best actor for the job. Finding Lupita Nyong'o, well, that was, that was a, a task to try and find, you know, Patsy. Um, so for me, it was a case of auditioning, finding people who I felt were the best for the part, and that was it. So it wasn't about um, non-American or European or African. It was about who was the best. And the fact that we came together with Americans and Europeans and Africans all together in New Orleans to make this film, well, more the better. It was so rich. And we shared and we, we you know, conversed. We were, we, we, we were, we were more than a, a group of actors. We were a family. Because the things we had to do on, in this picture went beyond the cruelty, the cruelty, and the things we had to share together. It went beyond what happens in normal life, what happens in any other film set. So it was pretty special having that United Nations of people really to play the, the, this, the, to play this movie. I must say that I believe that having used mostly artists from other cultures to depict the roles that you had uh, chosen them for in the film was, from my perspective, a real stroke of creative genius. I find that black artists, even now, today, with all that has been said, still portray a facade of who and what we are as a people and a culture mm -hmm. in America, <clears throat> rather than reveal in a more deep sense who we really are as a people and as a nation. And as a consequence, we find black actors who are always performing according to expectation rather than performing mm -hmm towards the destination of a liberation, of a look, of a style. And as a consequence, we keep submitting ourselves to these rather in, inferior scripts that are written to try to depict black life, not as black life really is as portrayed in 12 Years a Slave, but as black writers see the way in which they think Hollywood and the mass audience wants to see black people, and they perform in the way they think <clears throat> the audiences in America want to see us. I'm often told when we submit films that challenge uh, the status quo, we're told that, well, people are not interested in that. They don't want to see it. And what I think 12 years, uh, 12 years a slave did for us was to so impact upon that myth that people don't want to see, people don't want to hear, people don't want to look at black people and struggle. Well, that film put that argument to rest forever and for that, in and of itself, I and others are eternally grateful. 
And I raised the question at the beginning to end this diatribe. No, no. no you I raised the question at the beginning only because any number of young black people mm -hmm. have asked me, why did you cast it the way that you did? And I wanted you to have this plat well, uh, platform. I, I don't really understand the question. Because it's, it's, it's I mean, no one's talking about, um, you know, King Blanchett. No one's talking about Hugh Jackman. These Australian actors who play Americans. And no one's talking, I mean, the list of Russell Crowe, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis, shall we go on and on and on? It's, 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 it's a bizarre question. But maybe because these, these you know, it's, it doesn't really happen other than in a situation where it's portraying black people within America. So I've never heard that before in any other situation other than th this one. But the fact of the matter is I just wanted to have the best people for the job. And now that, and that's my criteria. I want to, you know, I want to make, I want to do a good job so I find the best people for the job. Anyway, as far as um, saying about the reach of the film, well, what was interesting for me about the reach of the film as far as, say, box office or people who came to the film, um, the movie made like 133 million, the, the, uh, the, of the 133 million abroad in Europe and the rest of the world. And it made 50, I think 53 million here in the United States. So there is a mass audience wanting to see films with people of, of color. So that was, that was, in fact, that was the first time in a way that's, that's actually happened. And actually that's broken a door. It's, oh, actually, it's, 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 we've blown it off these hinges that people now are thinking, okay, we can make a film which has mass appeal uh, outside of the United States with uh, a black cast. That's what, all this, that's what I'm very proud of, one thing I'm very proud of, that we actually prove that people are interested in good stories and not necessarily because this person is black or white. So that would always be that. My last question for our mm -hmm. segment. Uh, what have you in store for us next? Ah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Should you want me to say? Well, I, well, I'm, well, well, I'm working on a project with Mr. Harry Belafonte. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, about five years ago, um, this is before I met Harry, um, and I'll, and I'll rewind the tape further back. When I was about 14 years old, I had a neighbor, and he was a wonderful man called uh, uh, Mr. Milton. And Mr. Milton always used to cut newspaper articles out for me and put it in my, in, in the, my letter box and stuff like that. He was a guy, he didn't have any children, and he was from the same island as my mother and father was Grenada, but he just took an interest in me. And one day, he put a leaf, a, a booklet, in my, in my, in my uh, letterbox of a man called Paul Robeson. And it was really odd because it was about this, this black guy who was in Wales and he was singing with these miners. And I didn't, you know, at 14 years old, not knowing who Paul Robeson was. And a black, a black American in Wales was the last thing, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the 40s was really strange. So then, of course, I found, a lot of, I found out about him over the years. And I just found out that this man was just an incredible human being. And when you go out, at, out of the street now and ask someone, uh, who, who Paul Robeson is, most people won't even tell you who he, could tell you who he is. So I'm struggling. Um, but the, his life and his sort of legacy, sort of, oh, basically, the Robeson film was the, the film I wanted to make second after Hunger. That's the film I, want, I really wanted to make. But of course, I didn't have the power, I didn't have the juice. <laughs> um, and now we're, 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 we're very fortunate that we're on a road together, hopefully, to make this, 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 this uh, dream into reality. And of course, by meeting Paul, and excuse me, Harry, um, <laughs> <laughs> who was obviously a, a, a close friend of Paul's and having this relationship with him now, it's, it's just, you know, things happen, you know, miracles do happen. So I'm just we're very, very happy with the fact that this journey could possibly become a reality, finally. I would like to just once again express for all of us a deep sense of gratitude. Can I ask you a question? 
So what was it like that night? You got the Oscar last weekend. What was it like and what, I mean, I got yeah, let's just turn the tables here. It's slightly more interesting. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Power. It mean, was a revelation. I had spent so much of my life dealing with things that I've always thought were connected to the deeper substances. And whenever I get into this show business thing of awarding and awarding and awarding and awarding, I always look at it with great skepticism and great uh, distance and wondering what's behind the behind of. And when it became my turn, I all of a sudden had to view this through a lens, a perception that said I must deal with this at its least in a gracious way. So in attempt at being gracious, having been bestowed upon me this honor, I then began to realize deeper, deeper revelations. I've been blacklisted. I've been accused by institutions and by government and by people in my work as an activist and in all the work that uh, we have been honoring here tonight, all the things that you've heard, Many of us paid a price in that journey. And uh, Hollywood also played a role in that mischief. They blacklisted, they used the McCarthy period to alienate voices that they did not think were politically uh, saying the things that they thought should be said. And those of us who stood the ground paid the price in the blacklist. Now all of a sudden, I wake up one day and the most powerful institution in Hollywood, the American Academy of Arts, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Okay, how did you find out? How did they, was it a phone call, was it a letter? How did you find out? Yes, I got a call from a woman, black woman, <laughs> who's the head of the <laughs> American the president, Motion Picture Association, you're the president. And she said, uh, Mr. Belafonte, I would like to congratulate you. Uh, we have just had our board and it has unanimously agreed to bestow upon you the, an honorary Oscar. And we are here notifying you that we have done this and we hope you will accept. And I said, Abba, Agnya, Abba, Duba, Abba. And she said, I'm glad you've accepted. <laughs> well, that is how I learned of it. Well, it's kind of interesting that we both got Oscars in the same year. That's exactly. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, oh. Yes, go ahead. There's, there's just one thing. I have, a, I have a, a relationship with the Goodman family for the past, I think, 17 years, actually. Uh, and it's actually, it, it's a, it's, 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 it was the aunt of, of, of Andrew Goodman, a woman called Marion Goodman, who's here in the audience tonight. And I, um, I, was, an, I was a young artist around 26 years old. And you know, we're behind the ears. And this lady saw something in me, and she took me under her wing, and she supported me mm -hmm. um, in being where I am, sitting on the stage next to Harry Belafonte now. And it's called Marion Goodman. Marion, where are you? Can you stand up, please? Marion Goodman. <laughs> Marion. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for believing in me and believing in art, and it's just a, a tremendous sort of knowing you. And it's a, again, this is one of those weird things. Uh, Andrew Goodman, Paul Robeson, Harry Belafonte. It's uh, it's come full circle tonight. Thank you wow. so much. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, wonderful.